Victor Howard, and uh, I'm a, I call myself a blacksmith. Uh, it's it's the term I like the best, uh, but I'm sort of, um, I guess you could call me an architectural metal worker as well, but blacksmith sort of covers every, everything. Uh, I've been working doing since uh, 1984. I started full-time when I was 19 years old. So uh, I guess that's 30, 36, 37 years, something like that. And um, so that's, you need more, you want no, more that, detail at this point or? No, I, I that's, that's that. talking more than less. So you have to tell me when to stop and when to start. That's all good. And uh, yeah, that's one thing I've learned so far is I, I let you guys, you guys just do the talking and I, I, often I find the questions get answered themselves before you, before I even ask them. So it's always fantastic. Right. I just curious, something I, something I've been asking is, are you, are you uh, from Alberta? Are you from Calgary or where are you from originally? No, I grew up in, in Southwestern New Mexico. And so I've been in Canada for uh, 12 years and, um, but I, you know, in some ways it's familiar because it's similar terrain and culture that living here, um, but less history. I mean, I've always had a real interest in history and that's probably how I got to be a blacksmith was through um, things that I found and that I investigated around me while I was growing up. And maybe there's not quite so much a history of that here. Fantastic. And what, what brought you to Canada then from New Mexico? Definitely not the weather. Uh, well, I came um, long, long progression. I, I, I left New Mexico not long after I started working, and I, I um, because I did sort of an a traditional apprenticeship and traveled and, and worked for different people in different places, and so I did my first first two years kind of apprenticeship working with a man in, near Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then I moved, went to Colorado and worked in Colorado for a couple of years and then I came back to New Mexico and then I went uh, to Tennessee and I was in Tennessee for several years working at a place called the um, Metals Museum and it's kind of a, a center of metalworking knowledge in the U.S. and so through there I met craftspeople and blacksmiths all over the world really and uh, then I had worked for uh, a year in Louisiana and New Orleans. And then I spent a year in Britain working with um, blacksmiths in Britain. And then I came, when I came back to the US, um, I went to Seattle and started, opened my own business. So at that point I'd been sort of, had maybe eight or nine years of experience. And then I had my own business in Seattle for 10 years. And then I, um, and Alice and I started working together there. She's also a blacksmith. And uh, so then, um, then I moved the business back to the central US and worked in Missouri. And through all of this moving around and different contacts and, and working for different clients, I'm, I met a fellow in Calgary who um, kind of proposed that I come and work for him full time. Uh, because previously I'd been working for a large number of different clients. And so I came, came to Canada and brought all of, well, not all of our tools, but 20,000 pounds worth of our tools. And <laughs> so I've been working uh, for this man, Ian McGregor, at the, what he calls the Canadian Museum of Making, which is mm -hmm. his collection of antique tools and the blacksmith shop and sort of um, his... You know, privately funded investigation into kind of what we're talking about. Uh, he's what he's really interested in is people that have real specific skills and what drives them to to develop those skills and and sort of why it's uh, there's a human tendency for people to you know, get specialized in things and and he's kind of interested in interplay back and forth between art and engineering that kind of exists in in creative construction and where, where you're you're not necessarily working to drawings or to someone else's designs but you're doing the design yourself which is pretty much a pretty tight group and mm -hmm. um so 
you, it's kind of an informal fraternity, you know, it's like, so um, I know people all over the U.S. and, and really um, mostly English speaking countries, but, um, and um, it's, and there's an interchange back and forth as always has been, and a lot of uh, referrals of work. And uh, if you encounter a project that, you know, somebody else has better skills on or, or has done a lot of, you know, like for instance, if I got a big historical uh, restoration job, then uh, I've got friends that work to Colonial Williamsburg. If I had a specific question, I could call them up and say, you know, oh, how would you do this or something like that. Or, or it's, um, it's just a huge knowledge bank that really was in, has existed pretty much from the beginning of the trade, but it even before the computers, everybody communicated a lot. And that in this whole process of people traveling from one workshop to another and apprenticing and learning and exchanging ideas fosters that network and builds it. So that's part of the reason that I think people, have, it's not a necessarily a, always a profitable or a, a good thing to do to have, bring somebody into your business that isn't experienced, but it, you know, you kind of feel like you have to pay back what you received and, and it's, uh, and it just builds this whole community. I love that. that. That goes back to that uh, informal fraternity you were talking about. I really, yeah. I like that. I, I wrote that, uh, wrote that quote down. I really like that. And that, uh, that shows the, uh, yeah, the brotherhood of in the, the, the siblings, the siblinghood of it. That's well, the funny thing about it is that the, you know, there's the worst company of blacksmiths in Britain, which is, goes back to, I don't know, 1400s or something. And, uh, and it pretty, it's sort of a, a fraternal organization, like maybe like, the Elks or the something now, or, yeah. and really 99% of the people in it are not blacksmiths, but they're dentists and lawyers and, yeah. and people who, who want a club and, and want, and, and it's, uh, but it's, they've become interested in where the roots came from and where the name came from. And they've been more involved in the last 20 years with blacksmiths as blacksmiths sort of evolved. But I think Prior to that, everybody thought, well, blacksmithing is gone, but this is this is a good way to get together and we all call ourselves the worship <laughs> company of blacksmiths. And they have a motto and a, a, you know, and all of the things just like the Masons or any other organization that's yeah. primarily social. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it's, it's like a legion almost. Yeah. I love right, that. Yeah. That's a uh, well now I have to I'm curious now what where did the name come from of blacksmithing? Well, blacksmiths, they work with black metal. Okay. Iron, iron is black, uh, or the oxide of iron when it's been heated and hammered is black. So, uh, and I think in most people, you know, in antiquity thought of iron as black. Uh, so, you know, just Easy like enough. a coppersmith or a silversmith or a goldsmith, but it's, you don't call a coppersmith a pink smith, but they, their metal is kind of rosy. Fantastic. Yeah, there we go. Okay, easy enough. Uh, now, I think that the probably the the most important skill is is um, the ability to improvise and the ability to think creatively and, and relatively quickly. You know, that's one of the you know, blacksmithing is such an old trade and there's so many sayings that we use in common speaking that, that derive from you know, but the, the expression strike while the iron is hot is is it applies in, in all sorts of ways but that's where it came from and and that type of mentality is important you, know, you look at something you can make a decision quickly and act on it and, and it's you know, important as um so for most people, most blacksmiths today have to be business people and self, so generally self-employed. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, you're generally a self-employed crafts person. So you need all the skills that a self-employed person has. Fantastic. Which is confidence and ability to make decisions. I, I think it's, I think you're right. Uh, there's, 
there's sort of a um, a big fascination with trades. On one hand, people are interested in them, but I think the biggest thing that, that's making skilled trades um, disappear is, is our, our different perception of time that the modern culture has. So uh, number one, people don't start building skills soon enough. Um, you know, it's the uh, people used to start working when they were 12, 13 years old mm -hmm. and, uh, and as an apprentice and start um, you know, building skills. And by the time they were 19 or 20, they were skilled craftspeople and they had a lifetime to, to work. And, um, and they expected projects to take a year or two years or, you know, we, we, they, they built whole giant apartment buildings in less than a year now, you know, and they build, everything's so much faster and um, less scope for detail and less scope for, uh, you know, and there's, it's, it's just a different mindset. And, and I think it's harder for younger people to, to put themselves into a, a different frame of mind where they can see those details because they are, they're just not used to looking carefully at details. Um, so, I mean, that's not really a specific practice in a way, but, but I think it's a cultural sort of... Um, yeah, I, I completely agree where you're coming from. And, uh, you know, uh, even knowing um, from my generation as a Generation Z, um, that the the talking with all, all these people that we've talked to and there's no no education for it up until you're you know 18 19 years old and um I, I didn't get into a mechanic shop or, or a welding shop until my uh grade 12 year of, of of high school and by then i was 17 18 years old and when you're talking about 12 13 years old starting these trades um it's definitely a, a different a different world and even going into post-secondary especially in alberta um, there's only two schools really that you got Nate and State kind of dominating the scene, but there's not that uh, there's not that much diver um, diversity in education post secondary nationwide. Um, so I feel like that would also lead to it, and getting into these education uh, of these skills and trades later in your life is definitely not beneficial to preserving that trade. So it's hard that. because you know I mean in a way in in some ways it was also kind of incestuous and a little too closed because. Some families would, would, you know, it would, uh, people would, you know, there were, I think there were a lot of, um, I don't expect that my son would be a blacksmith and I, I didn't want to do what my father did. And, and I think that, that they, you know, when you get, there's some families where there's traditions of trades passing on and that's how they get started early. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think there was a, um, more recognition at one point in time that these trades were valuable and were skilled and they were valid ways of making a living. So it wasn't inappropriate to start on them younger. You know, that your time, it wasn't like you were, um, you learned other skills you need for life in addition or along with the, the specific skills you learned for your trade. It wasn't like, where you have to go and learn algebra and then, then you know, get all of this base work done get all of your writing skills and all of these things done and then then decide that you want to work more with your hands uh, because it's it's still you're still using your mind you know there's, there's less separation i think like early engineers i mean if you look at, at really creative people that were uh, they were artists and engineers and craftspeople like uh, da vinci or, or you know these really creative thinkers where they thought they, they one day they might be designing the, the cathedral and the next day they're carving stone. And I mean, they had all these skills and it wasn't, they, we have a very narrow idea of what people's specialties are now. I think that, okay, this person's you know, going to start and, and they'll be this and that's all they'll be. You know, they're, they're a radiologist. That's all, that's what they're going to do. They're going to go x-ray people every day for their working life. And, and they may have a hobby or something, but I think people used to cross pollinate much more, and 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 their their um, their work life was involved with their family life, and you know, it wasn't like you 
you work for so many weeks and then you had a week for holiday you just everything was all blended together you know it, when i worked mm. in britain with these old guys over there when they first started working they, they were they did their apprenticeship when they were 15 or 16 after the second world war and they were hungry i mean you know that britain was in a tough place and they really wanted work and uh, they they would work the guy they worked for had some land and they would all stop and go cut grain you know, they'd leave mm -hmm. the shop and go harvest the grain when it was time to do that, or they would help. He had some few pigs and animals, and they'd help with those. And, you know, I think that was a much more typical sort of way of everything was mixed together. We we divide things more clearly. Yeah, that um, even shows like it's uh, out of necessity almost in those situations, mm -hmm. for sure. And that's a, uh, I, com I completely agree where you're coming from, and that's a fascinating response to it. And I, I com wholeheartedly agree to it. Um, and you know what, that's, um, there's not, and there's nothing wrong with having that diversity in, in those trades and learning one thing, but also being proficient at other things and out of, out of that necessity oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I don't know if any, you know, like if any one specific trade is more, I, I think with it, uh, in general, I mean, like, I think the, one of the old models for blacksmiths was, you know, the, the life so short, the craft so long to learn. And yeah. um, the, um, you know, they, they've said that in you know, 1200 or something. So uh, it's, it's just, um, we, uh, hand skills take a long time to, to learn. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's some things with that my hands do automatically that I spent, I mean, I consciously spent years teaching them how to do that. And, uh, but I can't necessarily take that dexterity and translate it into something else. I think that I, I thought about that one. I thought that one's a, a kind of, a, it's not an easy question because it's, um, there's, but I, I think it's the, the, the specific things are small nuances of it. Like um, the, you know, currently blacksmiths get a lot of uh, sort of abuse because of the popularity of the Forge and Fires uh, program. Yeah. So everybody thinks that, oh, well, I know what a blacksmith does. And, <laughs> and, and it's sort of, um, it, you, you know, you, there's a certain kind of um, embarrassment almost about it. But uh, because of the, there's some aspects of knowledge are, you know, presented they're they're popular and but it's uh and, and you'll see people do a project in a very short period of time and uh the the little one of the things i think is, is funny is that and you know um i think blacksmiths were probably you know, started some of the first environmental <laughs> disasters on the earth and, and they propagated that whole tendency and then but so, so they're still, they're kind of um, a bit of a figurehead, you know, like, oh, well, blacksmiths make smoke and dirt and noise and, and pollution, basically. And, um, but the, the skills involving some of those materials, you know, like when I first started working, almost everybody burned solid fuel. And by that, I mean coal or, or coke or, you know, coal, basically, was what most blacksmiths used as their fuel. And now almost everybody is burning um, gas, propane, or natural gas. Uh, and um, except in, in industry, I mean, there's and there's a, a lot of move to try to figure out you know what would be a more suitable fuel. There's just a lot of energy consumed in it, no matter how you use it. You know, and there's a lot of energy consumed physically too. Uh, it's hard work too. But, um, but I'd say that that's one of the most specific things that I notice is that people don't know how to build a fire and they don't know how to uh, work in, in coal or you know, in solid fuel. And, um, and there's some things that were, were really good about it. And it wasn't, uh, you know, I think there's always a kind of a proportion in, or, or a balance in, in making some real durable good like if you consume a certain amount of energy producing something that's very durable, 
as opposed to consuming the same amount of energy to produce something that's thrown away. And I always felt like the, you know, the energy the blacksmiths used to produce certain items was, was justified by the end product and that it could be used for two or three lifetimes. So, because With the blacksmiths the, really didn't make disposable stuff. Would uh, the use of coal over propane, like, would change the longevity of it? Or is there it doesn't any really change the longevity coal? of it, but, it, you know, it, it, I think that, you know, there's a big perception that using coal is bad, mm -hmm. you know, from an environmental point of view. And it really, the emissions of the, or whatever happens when you burn propane, you just don't see it as much. You know, it doesn't make a cloud of smoke. So yeah. it doesn't really change the end product. Uh, the the refining of the propane has done been done elsewhere where you don't see it happening. Yeah. Um, so um, it just as the you know extraction from the earth or whatever it's like, but um, it doesn't really. I'm just saying it, that I, I find that you know everybody has sort of a heightened sensitivity towards environmental issues today, and uh, and I I I never had to feel like I had to justify that. Mm -hmm. in, when I began. Um, now for sure. And now there's much more of that. And uh, so that's that's probably the one of the biggest things that's really changing. But and the skills connected with uh, with you know working with those those uh, and they're probably pretty much gone. You know, like there's there could be black. I, there, I used to meet industrial blacksmiths who worked in, in heavy industry and they, they had no idea how to build a coal fire and they never worked in coal. Mm -hmm. and they worked in, in big gas furnaces or, or uh, fuel oil furnaces or something like that. I remember uh, I worked with a guy who'd been a blacksmith for 30 years one time and, I, and we went in my shop and I was building a fire and he said, what are you doing? What, what's, what's this about? You know, how's this work? I, I don't know. And I think that, you know, that knowledge that I used to take for granted is, it's probably that's probably one of the main things that's that's missing you know actually disappearing for sure and um now do you now do you personally use propane or coal or a medley of both i use a bit of both it, it you know on one level it doesn't really matter too much uh but they have uh, little nuances and they give you different level. you have each one it's like if you you know, if you play an acoustic guitar and then you play an electric guitar, I mean, mm -hmm. they're, they're different, but they're, they're very similar. You have the same motions your hands make, but, but you get a completely different sound. Uh, so it's, it's sort of the, um, you, you have to go through a learning period when you change mm -hmm. tools, you know, just the same as you would like, if you, you know. Uh, that, I think that guitar example is perfect. I think, you know, learning acoustic and then going to electric would be very different, but What those trades people are going to do, you know, like I find that the the specific knowledge, like for instance, if, if you were working with Dave and you were doing historic preservation where you wanted something, you know, you're working with the same materials that have been used originally, you want to put it back ex pretty much exactly the way it was done in the same way, then these um, those skills are important to transmit to that person. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, it doesn't, um, I always worked on paper and you know, drew everything out on paper. Nobody draws anything on paper anymore. You know, people do, uh, and they don't think about drawing things on paper. I, I worked with a, a guy who is really, is, is really skilled blacksmith and he, he's really interested in locks and safes and, and making medieval sort of strong boxes and you know, amazing stuff that, but um, when I first met him he was looking for resources and, and I gave him a list of books and he had never seen any of them and, and I thought they were pretty you know that would have was because he just wasn't a generation of people to go to books to get information he wanted he, he hadn't thought of and some of them yeah. were in the library right where we were, you know, we were at a craft school. And I said, well, I bet that book's right here on the shelf. And I went over and took it down and it's like, wow, you know, this is, this is so much information. <laughs> uh, it's, um, you know, that's the, to write a book, it, it takes somebody, 
they carefully think about it and they edit it and revise it and revise it and revise it and then finally publish it. And um, usually the information there is kind of a, a distilled to a little higher proof than the a YouTube video that somebody made in, in you know, a day. Yeah, and the, it's it makes you curious about what's going to happen in in thirty years of you know today's people uh, over video is is probably the most uh, most uh, accessible form of education for a lot of a lot of at least younger people. So I wonder what I wonder what uh, if that's going to be obsolete and what's going to come next to be that big that that learning utensil for sure. It I think it's a, a little dilution of this knowledge. It, mm -hmm. Use that you know it's like. It's still being transmitted, um, but it's maybe at a at a. Most of my knowledge came from you know directly from another person, and usually from a person that I was working with, uh, working for. Um, but a big part of my background, sort of to be ready to receive that knowledge, was from my parents, because my parents were both artists. And uh, my father was an art professor at the university. So I grew up surrounded by art history books and, um, and drawing and painting and you know, thinking in three dimensions and, and a lot of discussion about design. And, um, and it was, we never did anything without thinking about how the, it was gonna look when it was finished. It was, uh, it was kind of just intrinsic to um, even if, even if we brought you know things in from the garden or, or whatever it, they were all arranged in the house in a certain order we just didn't dump them on the floor in the corner or something like that it was it was just the way my parents were so so I got I think that habit of observing and and so it's kind of a, a prep to being able to learn from other people is observing fine details and cause and effect and uh, so most of the knowledge came from when I you know, went to work for somebody and I just worked beside them and, and uh, try to see what they were doing and, and pick up where they couldn't be or, you know, assist in any way. Fantastic. Here we go. All right. So if you don't mind just stating your name, uh, trades worked and years worked in these trades. All right. It's, my name is Japheth Howard and, uh, I'm a, I call myself a blacksmith. Uh, it's it's the term I like the best, uh, but I'm a sort of, um, I guess you could call me an architectural metal worker as well, but blacksmith sort of covers every, everything. Uh, I've been working doing since uh, 1984. I started full-time when I was 19 years old. So uh, I guess that's 30, 36, 37 years, something like that. And um, so that's need more. You want no, more that, detail at this point, or no, I, I that's, that's that. talking more than less. <laughs> so you have to tell me when to stop and when to start. That's all good, and uh, yeah, that's one thing I've learned so far is I, I let you guys, you guys just do the talking, and I, I, often I find the questions get answered themselves before. It, before I even ask them, so it's always fantastic. Right. I just curious, something I something I've been asking is, are you are you uh, from Alberta? Are you from Calgary, or where are you from originally? No, I grew up in in southwestern New Mexico, and so I've been in Canada for uh, twelve years. And um, but I, you know, in some ways it's familiar because it's similar terrain and culture that living here, um, but less history I and mean, I've always had a real interest in history and that's probably how I got to be a blacksmith was through um, things that I found and that I investigated around me while I was growing up and maybe there's not quite so much a history of that here. Fantastic and what, what brought you to Canada then from New Mexico? Definitely not the weather. Uh, well I came um, long long progression I, I, I left New Mexico not long after I started working and I, I um, because I did sort of an appre a traditional apprenticeship and traveled and, and worked for different people in different places and so I did my first first two years kind of apprenticeship working with a man in, near Santa Fe, New Mexico 
And then I moved, went to Colorado and worked in Colorado for a couple of years. And then I came back to New Mexico. And then I went to Tennessee and I was in Tennessee for several years working at a place called the um, Metals Museum. And it's kind of a, a center of metalworking knowledge in the U.S. And so through there, I met craftspeople and blacksmiths all over the world, really. And uh, then I had worked for uh, a year in Louisiana and New Orleans. And then I spent a year in Britain working with um, blacksmiths in Britain. And then I came, when I came back to the U.S., um, I went to Seattle and started opened my own business. So at that point, I'd been sort of had maybe eight or nine years of experience. And then I had my own business in Seattle for 10 years. And then I um, and Alice and I started working together there. She's also a blacksmith. And uh, so then um, then I moved the business back to the central U.S. and worked in Missouri. And through all of this moving around and different contacts and, and working for different clients, I'm, I met a fellow in Calgary who um, kind of proposed that I come and work for him full time uh, because previously I'd been working for a large number of different clients. And so I came, came to Canada and brought all of, well, not all of our tools, but 20,000 pounds worth of our tools. And <laughs> so I've been working uh, for this man, Ian McGregor, at, at, what he calls the Canadian Museum of Making, which is mm -hmm. his collection of antique tools and the blacksmith shop and sort of um, his you know, privately funded investigation into kind of what we're talking about. Uh, he's, what he's really interested in is people that have real specific skills and what drives them to, to develop those skills and, and sort of why it's, uh, there's the human tendency for people to get specialized in things and, and he's kind of interested in the interplay back and forth between art and engineering that kind of exists in in creative construction in a way where you're you're not necessarily working to drawings or to someone else's designs but you're doing the design yourself which is pretty much what I've always done that's fantastic that's a yeah I was um I was checking out the museum of makings uh site today and then it just seems absolutely fascinating and that's what i was telling dave dave was talking about and it's fantastic and i'll definitely be asking you um later on uh potentially for um uh some photos of your shop and if you have any photos of inside the museum of making you can email me at some point that'd be fantastic but we'll we'll uh, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit but that that a uh, great description and definitely uh, how many states have you been to or can do you know offhand uh I've worked pretty much over the U.S. except for the real Northeast. I never really worked in New England much, but um, the it's blacksmiths are a pretty tight group, and mm -hmm. um, so you, it's kind of an informal fraternity. You know, it's like so. Um, I know people all over the U.S. and, and really um, mostly English-speaking countries, but. Um, and um, it's and there's an interchange back and forth as always has been and a lot of uh, referrals of work and uh, if you encounter a project that you know somebody else has better skills on or or has done a lot of you know like if, for instance if I got a big historical uh, restoration job then uh, I've got friends that work to Colonial Williamsburg if I had a specific question I could call them up and say, you know, oh, how would you do this or something like that or, or it's, um, it's just a huge knowledge bank that really was in, has existed pretty much from the beginning of the trade, but it, you know, even, even before the computers, everybody communicated a lot and, and that in this whole process of people traveling from one workshop to another and apprenticing and learning and exchanging ideas fosters that network and builds it. So that's part of the reason that I think people, have, it's not a, 
necessarily a, always a profitable or a, a good thing to do to have, bring somebody into your business that isn't experienced, but it, you know, you kind of feel like you have to pay back what you received and, and it's, uh, and it just builds this whole community. I love that. That, that goes back to that uh, informal fraternity you were talking about. I really, yeah. I like that. I, I wrote that, uh, wrote that quote down. I really like that. And that, uh, that shows the, uh, yeah, the brotherhood of in the, the, the siblings, the siblinghood of it. That's well, the funny thing about it is that the, you know, there's the Worshipful Company of Blacksmiths in Britain, which is, goes back to, I don't know, 1400s or something. And, uh, and it pretty, it's sort of a, a fraternal organization, like maybe like you know, the Elks or the something now, or, yeah. and really 99% of the people in it are not blacksmiths, but they're dentists and lawyers and, yeah. and people who, who want a club and, and want, and, and it's, uh, but it's, they've become interested in where the roots came from and where the name came from. And they've been more involved in the last 20 years with blacksmiths as blacksmiths sort of evolved. But I think prior to that, everybody thought, well, blacksmithing is gone, but this is this is a good way to get together. And we all call ourselves the worship <laughs> company of blacksmiths. And they have a motto and, a, a, you know, and all of the things just like the Masons or any other organization that's yeah. primarily social. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it's like a legion almost. Yeah, I love right, that. Yeah. That's a, uh, well, now I have to, I'm curious now, what, where did the name come from of blacksmithing? Well, blacksmiths, they work with black metal. Okay. Iron, iron is black, uh, or the oxide. Sorry about that. I think the hardest part is um, I, I talk a lot about making decisions and um, choices because there's so many choices so I think the that's the hardest part is is choosing the the right um, bare boundaries to, to encompass your finished piece with so you know so it's you know people always say well you need to know when you're done stop when you when you're done or um, but but it's true it's it's um, Getting something right is is probably something that there's there's no real answer to it, but but there's but you just know it. Uh, you kind of there are times where I can just kind of working on a project can be a little bit of a struggle, uh, and you come to some point where you find you just kind of have a resolution that's like, yeah, that's it's done. It's that's good. It's it's right. And um, I don't know how you build that uh, sense or that um, develop that criteria really. It's an unteachable aspect. Yeah, it's really. made of a lot of subtle things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it's one of the most critical things about it. And, and that's why I think almost all craftspeople, blacksmiths, whatever uh, builders um, can be perceived as, as arrogant or um, opinionated is because they're going to make they're the only ones who make that decision that it's right mm -hmm. you're, you're the end person who's who you know I've had people come to me and say oh that looks great you know that's you're done and no I'm not you know you I, I don't care if you pay me for the next week or whatever I'm not done and I have to finish it and I and that's the way most you know hand workers are I think is they it's not there yet you, and so um because people say, well, what, what are your problem? You know, you're because <laughs> it's about something that's not about being paid. It's about it's just um, so it's, uh, it's tricky. I, and I like that. That's a yeah. There there really is no answer to it about getting right. It's just you know, and that comes with any any trade of of really anything. And the, that comes either easier than others. And and any job really, because there, there are some criteria that, you know, you, you do meet and once you meet that criteria, you're good. But when it's a, like you said, with the, when it's a, just a trade and when you're working with your hands, you know, and when you're making that thing, you know, that's, a, that's something that just comes with it. That, you can't teach you that. You can't do it again. You know, you can't yeah. do it over again. My, my kids uh, have played a lot of music and done a lot of musical things. And music interests me because every time a musician plays a piece of music, it's different. 
but mm -hmm. somebody wrote that music and they put all of the dynamics and suggestions in there on the way they wanted it played. But every time someone plays it, it's different. But you can play it over and over and over again and continually improve it. But if you build a wall, you build a wall. I mean, if, yeah. <laughs> if you take it all down and start over again, it, it doesn't really work and it's kind of pointless. And so you have to live with the flaws that you know are in there uh, and you have to, but you have to try to hold the whole level, the whole thing to the highest possible level you can throughout the, you know, because a, a building project is, is an evolution from start to top. You can't go back and do the beginning over again. Really. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, we were talking about computers and, and that's one thing that's really different about the, you know, the ability to write, draw or work with computers is you can go back to the beginning and change things a little more quickly than you can in the physical world. And um, so I think that you know, that's, that's part of this process of getting it right and, and um, knowing things is, is you, ha you have to make peace with yourself as you go through the process that, okay, it's, it's right. It's right for me. It may not really be right for the person that you made it for, or or it's going to be right for them for a different reason. But it's um, you know, it's that that's it's another. Well, the one thing that about um, blacksmithing is pretty simple tools. You know, it's it's because um, the process is so elemental that it's it's you're doing the same thing over and over and over again just slightly differently and whether you you're doing it with tools that you um that are really beautiful sophisticated tools or whether you're doing it with you know they make incredible stuff uh with very basic tools in cultures where they don't have a lot of tools so it's um, tools are tools and materials you know also uh, I mean, materials change. Uh, there's, there's not uh, a lot of the materials have changed a lot in my lifetime. And steel is different than it used to be, and, and there's less quality control on things. There's less um, options. You know, like I think there were more varieties of materials available when there was more demand for them. Um, it's and when things were um, sold differently to you know, now most come like I, I basically work with industrial materials you know steel is is pretty industrial material and you don't people don't think about um, you know buying steel like you buy a loaf of bread it's the only people who buy steel are people who are going to build a bridge or a skyscraper right and they buy you know 15 semi loads of it. They don't buy a couple little pieces of it. So most of the, and the market is gonna gravitate to serve the people who buy the most of it, not the people who buy the least of it. So the little specialties, little odds and ends, small things that, um, you know, like for instance, uh, rivets and, and pieces of, that are used to join together pieces of steel were used an awful lot in wagon construction and early vehicle construction, they're not so widely used anymore. So they're not so widely available in industry. So they're not so widely available to individual people like me. I can make my own, I can make them out of nothing. I can, I can take a piece of wire and make a rivet out of it. Mm -hmm. But a blacksmith of 80 years ago just went and would buy five pounds of those rivets and you didn't have to make them. So it's uh, so he used a lot more maybe than I do. You know, if I have to make all of mine by hand, so um, the, um, the materials are they can be very very basic. Really, you basically need heat and a hammer and um, you know a little bit of steel, a little bit of material. Um, but it's you know I've never done it, but. I know people who have, and and it's still done. You know, where you make steel from scratch, yeah, from, from nothing. Uh, and uh, I read a really neat article about these people in Siberia that are making steel in an environment just about like the one here in Alberta. You know, with poplar trees and and not a whole lot of anything. There's not. It's not like they have coal and 
mines and and all this kind of stuff. But they make enough steel to make a little knife, and that and they still use those knives um, on a daily basis. And it changes, you know, makes their lives much easier. So it's. Uh, How would you go about making steel from scratch? How would that work? Well, you, you just have to uh, find a, a source of. Um, you know, there's lots of iron in, er, in the earth. There's there's mm -hmm. iron. Um, is I think it's the tenth most common element in the earth's crust is iron. Okay. So um, there's um, you just have to find a place where it gets concentrated, and it gets concentrated um, by various things. You know, I mean, of course, it get concentrated by volcanic activity or something like that. But natural organisms also concentrate iron. Uh, mm -hmm. algae, algae is often orange and reddish and orange and um, where you have peat bogs in places where there have been millennia of, of algae dying, you get big chunks of rust in the bottom of them because of all of this iron uh, concentrated uh, organisms have died and like kind of like a coral reef only they're concentrating iron instead of calcium and uh, so but it's all iron oxide and so iron um, and steel that is doesn't have that oxygen in it, but we know like, like your car <laughs> eventually goes back to iron oxide. Yeah, and so it um, so that's that's the natural process of uh, iron likes to combine with oxygen, but to make metallic iron, you have to take the oxygen out of it. So the way you do it on a basic level is you put it in a fire, and you put the enough fuel on the fire that there's more fuel than there is uh, oxygen. Because you know, the fire consumes oxygen, and so uh, eventually, on a on a molecular level, you know, the chemistry of the iron will change, and the oxygen will come out of the iron and go into the be consumed by the fire, and the iron converts it back to metallic iron. So um, it's a it's fairly simple chemistry, but it's it's fairly sophisticated too. And so uh, then you, you end up with a, um, what was a big chunk of, of iron oxide is, is kind of a spongy mass of, of iron mixed in with pieces of, of silica from the, um, you know, whatever dirt or anything else was mixed in with it. And then it's just like kneading bread. You just, you, you can't touch it with your hands. So you have to hammer on it, but they use wooden mallets, first of all, to consolidate this lump into a kind of a sticky mess, like um, you know, like too wet um, bread dough, and mm -hmm. then and then they keep packing it in and uh, consolidating it, and they get holding it at a high heat so that the silica stays molten because it's like molten glass, and you squeeze the glassy part out of it and consolidate this iron part of it until you have a solid chunk of iron, um, and it's it's a basic kind of refining process. You know, people were good at all those kind of things. It's it's like making butter out of cream. You know, yeah. Um, and Just or, that easy. <laughs> yeah, whatever. And then uh, and then to make steel, because that's what you first said is how do you make steel? Yeah. Because um, and steel is not a element like iron is. Steel is a combination of two elements, which is iron and carbon. Mm -hmm. So it's an alloy. So. Then in the process of, of all of this heating, you've done it in a carbon rich atmosphere because most natural fuels are carbon uh, mm -hmm. based, uh, you know, wood or whatever, uh, living things are made out of carbon. So um, the when iron is heated to a high heat, it absorbs carbon and um, it's kind of like a sponge. And so when it's in a carbon rich atmosphere, it absorbs carbon and when it gets a, up around one percentage of, you know, which isn't very much, one percent carbon out of a hundred percent. We have 99 percent uh, iron. It becomes steel and it becomes steel that when it's cooled suddenly gets really, really hard and, and holds an edge. So that was, that's the way they used to make steel. They would take slabs of iron and, and pack it into vessels that had no air in them and pack carbon, they packed leather scraps and bone dust in there because they're very carbon rich and heat it for long periods of time and the, the carbon would migrate into the iron and make it into steel. Just like that, just easy. 
So That's yeah, a, but, you know, but people have been figuring this out for three thousand years. And so uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's amazing. It really is. That's a, uh, and you know, it obvi obviously it's a, uh, you know, it when when you know how to do it, when the way you explaining it to for me, I I, I know the basics of I know steel is made of carbon and iron, and I, I but you know besides that, it's it's um that's not, that's very remarkable, and that that people still do that to this day, and and uh, that uh, also just makes me think of the. Um, how we were talking about earlier about out of necessity having to do these things mm -hmm. um and that's that's just uh seem seemingly uh, an important uh, important theme that i'm that i'm getting from but it's from about sharing. people that are carefully tuned to nuances exactly you know, the people who are watching the fire and won't take it in every little detail of it you know they're not exactly just sitting and they're and they're like wow something different is happening down here than is happening over here and when i dig it up afterwards this part black or this part's red and and you know, I wonder if I could do that again, or this part got hard and this part's still soft, or you know, so there it's this cause and effect, it's all about observation and trained observation. And the more carefully trained you are at observing, the more you observe these thing, nuances. And then then people are, you know, they turn good things to their benefit and, and manage to avoid bad things. And and uh, so it's that's that's just people and so I, I always tell people that you know that blacksmiths um, were trained by by materials. Mm -hmm. Really, the first blacksmiths were trained by materials, and, and that's how it evolved. And I like that. So it's um, you know so it's a it's it's a very you know when you ask me about materials and tools, they're they're really tightly connected to the process because it's um, you know it's basically the same process that I used to make my because I'm making tools for somebody else. It's just the same yeah. making tools for myself. And, you know, there's very, very seldom jo any jobs that I don't make a tool for. Um, yeah. So, and I don't know, that's, most trades do that, but I think blacksmiths are a little bit different in that respect, because um, if you're a mason, you know, you're shaping stones or bricks or whatever and, and using a, a trowel all day, but, and, and you're going to, cut a chunk of wood and use it for a stake or prop something up or, or wrap a string around something. Or, uh, but, you know, I might make two or three real specific tools and when they're done, they, I'll never ever use them again on mm -hmm. another job. Uh, and they just go back into the pot, so to speak, and they turn into something else. That's me. I, and I like that line that I think that that um, you know, I think one of the sort of reasons for the need for spirituality in people, in, in human beings, is, is so that you know when you, we're going back to this question, how do you know when you got it right? So you know, spirituality, the reason why most cultures have some type of spirituality is, is so that to help them define when they got it right, you know how 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 do you know you got your life right? So um, so I think that you know, as far as um, craftspeople and spirituality, I think it's it's really close. I, I don't think there's any real way of separating it um, because um, there's um, is it, um, you know there's a in many sort of like if you could look at any kind of monastic orders or anything like that, work is, is very often a big part of it. You know, purpose. Purpose is, uh, I, there's a book called the, the Reinvention of Work. It was written by, a, I think it was a Benedictine monk who eventually got excommunicated from the Catholic Church. But it, he's, he said that, you know, people need work and, and not not just um, you know a job to go to every day but they need meaningful work so if you're a craftsperson and you're happy in your work you you know you're kind of imbued with a certain amount of spirituality it's just intrinsic to what you're doing and um, you know I, I mean there are grumpy people that that you know, old sour blacksmiths and people that have problems, I'm sure. But 
but on one level, it's there's a lot of satisfaction involved in it, and I think that that's an important part of it. And the other thing that in in history with blacksmithing is really connected with with um, spirituality and and, and suspe whatever you want to call it or, or um, kind of theories because blacksmiths sort of you know, they kind of do things that aren't that are a bit magic, right? And it's like you, you think, well, how do you make iron out of nothing? And blacksmiths like, well, you just do it like this. Yeah. And so uh, in, in early cultures, the diff, the, the separation between somebody who's like, well, yeah, you just take a rock and make it into iron, is sort of, and and somebody who's you know spending the day, spending their lives, you know, herding sheep or something the person who's herding sheep is going to be a little suspicious of this guy who's you know performing this magic off to the side so in a lot of cultures blacksmiths were 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 kind of they were viewed as powerful people and they were um they were respected but they were a little bit feared too because they it, you know, there was sort of a question about how they really got these skills that they were using if that was that was entirely um uh, you know, fair. <laughs> if they hadn't made a you know, deal with the devil or whatever you want to, however you want to describe it, to uh, to get these. So, um, it's. I think that uh, you know that an iron has a goes has kind of a is a protective material. Most in a lot of cultures, you know, like in, in Ireland, uh, an iron nail will keep the fairies and the leprechauns away from you and and uh, uh, horseshoes are, are good mainly because they're um, made of iron not so much because of the shape yeah but um so um and in africa iron is viewed as sort of the concentrated uh, uh, essence of the earth the like the blood of the earth so um people who work with it have kind of a uh, you know um, it, can, it rubs off on you, I mean, literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, so I think that um, you know, for me, I think that that that's the the most important part of that spirituality side of it is is feeling like you're doing something that that you respect and you think is important, and your peers respect and think that it's worthwhile doing, and and you just you're happy, you're satisfied at the end of the day, and it's um, that's a good feeling, and it and then when you can extend that um, good feeling to other people by teaching them the trade and and seeing other people draw that same gratification from their work, that's that's kind of a you know I mean I think that's in a way what what a minister is trying to do with his congregation right is is lead people into lives that are worthwhile that they feel like give them satisfaction and they're happy about so it's um they're connected yeah i uh i think that's a really really great answer